ahead and start when you when you want to. Okay, yeah, start. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to HGO's virtual congress. We are thrilled that you are all here um, to spend quite a lot of time this weekend, hopefully, uh, with us uh, doing our sessions. Um, we have over 550 people registered, which we're absolutely thrilled about, uh, from 45 countries, and we're absolutely delighted about that. So my name is Matthew Ellison, and I'm the founder and project coordinator of HDEO. And that's me there with my son, Joey. Um, and my story and HDEO's story are very much intertwined. So my, my father is here. Uh, this is me as a baby, believe it or not. Um, when I was very cute, of course, <laughs> and as my mum would say, what happened? Um, so, and I'm sitting on my father there. Now, my father was diagnosed with Huntington's when I was seven years old. And up until that point, my life was, was normal. Um, but then out of the blue, they, my dad didn't know he was at risk. And then boom, he was diagnosed with, with HD when I was seven and he was 40. And my mom and dad told me straight away about Huntington's disease and what it was. But obviously just being seven, I didn't understand a lot. And when you consider um, that my father looked, looked completely healthy, it was a very, it was a very hard thing for, for a young person to kind of, kind of, comprehend what you're being told there and what, what this is. Um, so when I was seven and I was just found out, it didn't really impact me that much at all. I thought, okay, what is this? No idea. Now, when I was 13, life got very, much, very, very difficult for me as a young person in a HD family. I really struggled at 13. Um, I was depressed. Probably I could say I was depressed. I was in denial. Um, I was embarrassed about my father. And I had his symptoms that he had. At that point, he had a lot of movements. And I, it was a stressful household and it was a stressful environment. Um, my mum was looking after my dad as much as she could and looking after me as well. And just the burden of Huntington's was starting to, to, starting to grow. Um, but also at school, I was getting bullied uh, because my father had Huntington's disease. Um, so I became um, incredibly stressed out. And at that point in my life, it was when I just decided, OK, you know, I can't keep going on like this because it's just not healthy for me. Um, I don't know what's going to happen if I'm just stressed all this time. So I left school when I was 13. Not advised, but you know, it, it, it kind of worked for me in the end. Um, my mum wasn't wasn't too thrilled about the idea as well. Um, so when I left school at thirteen, uh, it was really to to relieve that stress from my life because yeah, it was just getting so stressful because of Huntington's disease. I felt like that was the only thing that I could do to relieve the stress. Um, and it worked. It worked. I was and up until I was about sixteen. I stayed at home and with my father and helped look after him. Um, so I spent a lot of time with my father and that was a really nice time because I was able to connect with him, which was important. And uh, you know, I said earlier that I was embarrassed to my father and that's something that a lot of people feel. I know a lot of people feel that from families. And, um, but eventually, when, when I didn't have the stresses of other things happening, um, I was able to kind of sit down and kind of say, okay, it's not his fault. And um, I need to, I know I want to be there for him and care for him and, and love him. So um, it was very useful in that regard, in my mentality to have that time to kind of not be so stressed out. Um, and in terms of my education, I was still, I was being homeschooled. So I was getting some schoolwork each week from school and I was, I was doing enough to get by basically. Um, and I got some GCSEs, which is what we get here in the UK. 
Um, so I got some GCSEs to, to, to do what I wanted to do if I wanted to do something, university or et cetera like that afterwards. Um, so when I was 18, this is actually not me when I was 18, this is a little bit older than 18, but this is as close as I could get. Um, so when I was 18, I had, um, I just really felt like I wanted to get tested. And that was not something that had come up uh, before for me. I had known I was at risk. Um, I'd known I was at risk since I was about 10 years old, but when I was 18, I suddenly, suddenly felt like I wanted to get tested. And I know, speaking with a lot of young people through HDO, sometimes the young people have this feeling where they just, they, they know they want to get tested as soon as you turn 18. Um, and that wasn't me. I, was, I didn't do it that way, but it just kind of ended up being like that anyway, because um, as soon as I turned 18, I suddenly started thinking about my risk as a coincidence. And I just thought, okay, I do want to know. I do want to know if I'm going to be HD positive or HD negative and how that's going to impact my, my future. So I told my, told my mom. Um, she was fully supportive of, of my decision. And when we, and then I started the process. At that point, my father was um, obviously progressing. He had been symptomatic for 11 years, or diagnosed for 11 years. And he was struggling to, to walk. Um, here he is now in this picture here. He was struggling to walk, talk, uh, feed himself and all those kind of things. Um, he was very much um, going towards the end of stages of Huntington's disease progression. Um, so I, my, I had tests, I was genetic counselling for six months and when I got my results I was positive with a repeat of 45. Um, my father was a repeat of 44. So very surreal moment in my life and yeah I think anyone who's gone through that that feeling of getting your results knows that kind of just that, phew, it's completely weird feeling um it takes time to adjust for sure and that's the advice i always give out to young people who ask as well about testing is it just you have to give yourself time to adjust because it's gonna it does take time and you have to kind of let yourself kind of just process what's happening and get get used to that new new hd status if you like um so and but i was still caring at this point i was still just at home uh living with my mom and dad and caring for my dad as much as i could i was working as well but also my mom was was now working um was was not working at all she was just at, at home caring for my dad full time so it was hard work at home and then when i was 21 um my father passed away and this is actually one of the last pictures I have of my dad. Um, it's like a couple of months before he passed away, I think. Um, and you can see here, you know, he, he's, he didn't talk for the last few years of his life. Um, and he was very, you know, very immobile, as, as I'm sure a lot of people from families will know. Um, I was there when he passed away and I'm grateful that I was there. Um, as emotional as that was, I'm, I'm grateful to, to have had that time with him. Um, so when he passed away, um, I realized that, uh, well, I had some time to think about things after he passed away. So I was 21 and I was thinking what to do in my time, but I realized that actually looking back at my life, for the first time I realized actually HD had had a huge impact on my life as a young person growing up in a HD family. And I never really thought about it like that before. And suddenly just a light bulb moment, I was like, actually, HD has been the cause of a lot of these things that have gone have gone badly for me in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and there wasn't a lot there for me. Um, so my, my mom and dad had had options for services. They had, you know, doctors, et cetera, et cetera, and support groups. But there wasn't anything for me as a young person growing up in a family with HD, um, or pretty much next to nothing. And that was a problem. And what I realized was that that wasn't just me because I was speaking with young people all over the world and that was a problem everywhere. So 
therefore that was the that was the start point for the idea of HDEO as an organization. So HDEO addresses a few things really, or tries to address a few things. So we have problems for young people in getting access to services for support. And we have problems with emotional resources, uh, educational resources. So people can't really learn about HD in an appropriate way before HDO's website. You know, young people couldn't do that. Um, I remember going online and trying to find stuff when I was a teenager. And it's very difficult to find content that was right for me. And um, the only content that I found, I just didn't, it just didn't work for me. Um, so we, we try to address that with the website. And another crucial thing we try to work on is access in languages. So a lot of this content that is available for young people is not in any other languages. So um, if, you're not, if your language isn't English, then you're gonna struggle to find anything at all online that's gonna help you. So that was something we really wanted to sort out because, because young people are just so isolated. So therefore, that was why we created HDO. And Huntington's Disease Youth Organization, or as we like to call it HDO, and it's here to support, um, educate, and motivate. And we started in 2012. And after about 18 months of work to get it set up, um, and that work was done primarily by myself, but we also had a team of young people who helped me do those things. Um, and we also had some volunteers who were doing stuff with the translations and things like this. Um, so we had a, quite a lot of people um, around the world, uh, all young people uh, from HD families, helping me to set up this organization to help other young people. Um, so this is what our website looks like as of right now, today. Um, and it's, it's been a part, of our, a part of our service since, since 2012. It didn't look like this when we first started, but we, you know we've we've put some new paint on it since then. But uh, it's pretty much it's the same. Um, we have a lot of educational content on here. You can click on the tabs, and you'll you'll see content for different age ranges. Um, so this is the educational content uh, for young adults or teenagers might look like. For example, we have a lot of videos in our sections to make it easy for people to kind of read the stuff and process it, and make it engaging. And if you're a child trying to learn about Huntington's disease, we have um, this program called HDO Land, uh, which can be found in the children's section. Um, and that's something just to help parents and children kind of get that learning starting at an earlier age um, in a more appropriate manner, of course. So we've got not just got the website, we've also done, we started to branch out quite early and do a lot of services and events. So we started to develop uh, youth camps. And the first one we did was in Europe in 2013. And we did another one in 2016. And we did, and we've done youth camps in North America, we've done five. So one in 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And we've done two youth camps in Australia and New Zealand. And we've also done a training event in South America couple of years ago. So the youth camps have become a really uh, important factor of, of HDO and what we do. Um, so basically, if you're not, if you're not uh, familiar with what our youth camps are, we bring young people together for three or four days. Um, and we have like, we take about 50 young people from HD families. And they usually, for our youth camps, they're usually um, like late teens, early young adults um, and we they get to have fun they get to do activities but they also get to do a lot of educational and sharing on HD and that was something that when we did our first camp in Europe um, in 2013 um, the feedback there was that actually we hadn't done enough educational resources um, even though we thought we'd done a decent amount but the feedback there was that we had not done enough so um, we, we increased that uh, quite a lot um, and now our camps are very, very, uh, you know, educational focused and we get great feedback from the young people that attend these events. And of course, the point of these events is that they get to get that peer support and connection that they can take back with them as well. 
and also they get that support with us as a team, uh, which is really important too. Um, and these events have all happened at no cost to the young people or families. So we've, we've, we've been very fortunate to get support from Pharma and also the HD associations around the world to do the events that we do and to do the educational content that we do. Um, and that means that we're able to bring young people um, at no cost to themselves. So it's really um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, service that we offer. And also it, it stresses the point that HDO is absolutely global. And, and this really, really important point because it's very easy to say that uh, we want to support young people around the world, but doing it is another thing. And we try to do it as much as we can. And, and we're, we're working hard to keep expanding on that as well as we keep growing. So some of our stats here. So we've had millions of views uh, on our website. Uh, the most important thing we've got here is probably the, the website in 14 languages. It's, it's just uh, fantastic. And that's all through the volunteers have done this. It's just uh, incredible. Um, so yeah, 14 languages on our, on our site with all the educational content is available in those 14 languages. Um, I'm so happy and uh, appreciative of the volunteers who've made that possible. Um, we've done a lot of events around the world um, and I estimate that about 1,200 young people have attended HGO events for free and our educational articles have been shared a lot of course and we have 2.7 million views on our YouTube channel um, which is apparently the most popular HD YouTube channel in in the world I think um, yeah whatever I mean you know not as many views as some YouTube channels, but hey, it's a start. Um, and we've supported, it's probably the most important stat here, we've supported over 6,000 young people around the world from 90 countries, which is just uh, incredible. Really pleased about that. Um, so our team, uh, at the moment, it's, it's pretty much just me. <laughs> we've come back to being pretty much just me. Um, so I'm full time. And we have, we've just recruited somebody part-time to run our juvenile HD uh, registry, which we'll be talking about tomorrow, um, which is opening very soon. Um, we did lose a couple of staff members last year, thanks to, thanks to the challenges that COVID has brought. Um, but it's been, you know, that's, it's not just HGO that's been affected by that. The whole world has been affected by that. So it is what it is. Um, but we are looking to hire more people soon and start rebuilding our team um, and recovering from, from, from last year, really. Um, we have a good boarding committee who really help us a lot. And I'll show those in a minute. And I want to thank our volunteers who really are amazing. We've probably had about two to 300 volunteers um, over over the years that we've been running, um, who've just been helping us do a number of different things. Um, and I wanna say a special thank you to Kat, Chandler and BJ, uh, who have been, I don't know if they're listening today, but they've been uh, absolute keystones to HDO. Um, I'm really, I'm really um, so thankful and appreciative for the time, effort and dedication that they have given HDO over the years and they are a key part as to why HGO is what it is. Um, so, and actually BJ is speaking later today. So uh, I would highly recommend you go and, go and listen to BJ's talk as well. And I also want to thank the Griffin Foundation who have been uh, a wonderful supporter to us financially and have really allowed us to do what we've wanted to do, um, allowed us to grow as well, um, to, to do what we want to do on a global level. So I really appreciate the Griffin Foundation support. Um, so thank you. The HGO board, and we have our committees as well. So Haley is our chair, and we have a bunch of committees that help us. As we've only got a small staff team, we need as many as many good, good, strong people to help us involuntarily as we can. Um, so thank you to the board and committees that we have. Future of HGO. Okay, so <laughs> the future's bright. The future's white, apparently. Um, so here we go, we've got, we want to keep doing what we're doing, basically. Uh, we've been doing really well, and we want to keep doing that. We want to keep providing events. We want to keep providing uh, events for young adults as well. But we also want to expand what we do. 
and expand the areas that we work in and the regions of the world that we work in as well. So you've seen that we've, we've gone to quite a lot of regions of the world, but we want to go to more. So we're working on that very hard. Um, but yeah, we want to keep expanding what we're doing, keep offering more educational content as well, uh, and, and keep doing the good stuff. Um, <laughs> so I, I, sometimes I have these HCO talks and I kind of forget um, to mention my family. So uh, I, I put in a slide this time that I definitely wouldn't forget to mention my family. Um, so here we've got my wife, uh, Mariana, and my son, Joey, who is almost four now, uh, bless him. And so uh, Mariana is actually, she's speaking later um, because my, my son, Joey, um, was born as a result of uh, PGD IVF. So if you're interested in learning more about that, then I definitely recommend listening to Mariana's talk later. Um, very informative. Um, but yeah, uh, Joey, if you're watching at home, which you should be, hopefully, hopefully you're being a good boy for mommy. And I love you to the moon and back, my boy. Um, thank you. And I hope you really enjoy the next two days. Uh, we've got so much content for you to enjoy that, um, that I really hope that you'll have a great time. If you have any questions at all, if you want to contact me, this is my email. Um, and thank you. I know this is the first session. So thank you for joining me for the first session. Um, the next sessions we've got on track one and track two. On track one, we've got um, Alice Wexler going to be talking about the Wexler story, which is absolutely incredible. And on track two, we've got Dr. Wynal, who's going to be talking about lifestyles and staying healthy. Okay, um, so you have to, I appreciate your time, but uh, you have to leave this session and then go back to the auditorium room and then you can choose between track one and track two, which one you want to join at 4.30. Um, and no, no questions on this session, but you will be highly encouraged to do questions and to provide questions in the next sessions coming up as well. So thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy all the sessions today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Have a good time, folks. We'll see you throughout.